contrast, the second globalization emerged in the post-1983 period, following a gradual rollback of restrictions imposed during an era of nationalism. This period witnessed unprecedented levels of international integration, with core nations granting substantial access to peripheral countries, even in the face of conflicting foreign policies or military strategies. The expansion of global trade, investment and technological exchange during this time underpinned remarkable economic growth and development across regions. However, as we navigate the complexities of global economics, it's evident that the landscape is evolving once again. The emergence of what some cautiously label as the third globalization signals a shift towards greater selectivity and conditionality in international economic relations. In this new era, access to core markets is no longer guaranteed, with barriers to the movement of labor, capital, goods, services, and ideas being reinstated based on geopolitical considerations. Today's session will delve into the implications of this evolving paradigm. What specific restrictions have arisen in this third globalization, and what additional constraints can we anticipate in the future? How do these restrictions impact countries differently, particularly those on the periphery? What are the potential ramifications for global economic growth and the allocation of tangible and intangible capital? And how do policymakers and business navigate this shifting terrain? And what are the implications for optimal policy choices? We have a fantastic panel with experts from all around the globe, and we intend to unpack these complex questions and foster a deeper understanding of challenges and opportunities presented by evolving global economic order. So it's my pleasure to introduce our panel, which is chaired by Do uh, Dr. Jyoti Chandramani. So Dr. Jyoti Chandramani, can I invite you up, please? And can we give her a big round of applause? She's Director of Symbiosis School of Economics, Dean of Faculty, Humanities and Social Sciences at Symbiosis International University. She brings over 35 years of experience in teaching, institution building and research, recognized for her educational contributions, including representing India at international conferences. She's received the prestigious awards such as the Gold Karamvir Chakra and Rex Karamvir Global Fellowship. Her research focuses on urban development and international economic cooperation as evidenced by her publications. We also have Dr. Famida Khatun. Is that the right pronunciation? Yes, okay. Executive Director, Center of Policy Dialogue, Bangladesh. Can I welcome you? Big round of applause, please. She's the Executive Director, Center for Policy Dialogue in Bangladesh, non-resident fellow at the Atlantic Council. Dr. Khatun holds a master's and PhD in economics from University College London. She has a career that spanned research roles at BIDS, UNDP, and USAID. She's a respected figure in the field, and she served on economic panels and advisory committees in Bangladesh, where she's known for her research findings, which have been widely published. We also welcome back a speaker who was speaking yesterday, Mrs. Anneken Huitfeldt, former Minister of Foreign Affairs, Kingdom of Norway. Please give her a big round of applause. She brings extensive experience in international relations and diplomacy, and as a former minister, she's been deeply involved in shaping Norway's foreign policy and navigating complex geopolitical landscapes. We also have Ra Rahul Bajoria, Chief Economist, Asia Pacific for Barclays Bank. Rahul, welcome. Big round of applause, please. He leads thematic research across Asia Pacific and serves as Chief, Chief Economist for India with a Master's in Economics from the National University of Singapore. His expertise spans time series econometrics and financial volatility models. Formerly at INSEAD and NUS Business Schools, he specializes in productivity and growth. He's also produced a publication 
on the story of the Reserve Bank of India, offering a comprehensive history of the central bank. So lovely to have all of you. And online, we have Professor Lars Hendrik Röhler from the European School of Management and Technology. Hans, well, uh, sorry, Lars, Lars Hendrik, welcome. He holds a number of positions, including chairman of BlackRock's TIAC and a fellow at the European Economic Association. With a remarkable career as chief economic advisor to Chancellor Merkel um, and Germany's Sherpa for the G7 and G20 summits, he's been recognized with awards like the Gossen Prize and Orders of Merit from Italy, Denmark and the Netherlands. I will now pass over to Jyoti. Jyoti, please take the discussion on the third uh, globalization ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, give the panel a big round. Uh, nice to be here with my co-panelists. I don't have a co-pilot uh, nor AI in this session, uh, though we may have referred to it on a number of occasions. But let's go with the flow. Um, we were talking about this particular session today. We talk about geoeconomic challenges in the era of flux. And then I went back over a hundred years. I went back to the World War, one, to the Russian Revolution. I came down to the Great Depression, moved further, and we moved to the World War II, and then the establishment of, you know, the Bretton Woods coming in, UN coming in, Cold War thereafter, decolonization, OPEC crisis, I'm sure all of you can link it with different decades. And as we go on, I come to 1986, the Eurogay round, and then from there, it's the establishment of the, the work towards establishment of GATT in 1995. As an economist, 1990-91 is very important for me because I'm also a development economist. And there it comes with the HDI or the Human Development Index and come down to 2000. That's Millennium Development Goals. But we don't have a good break in between where in 1997 you had the Southeast Asian crisis. In 2001, we had the dot-com bust. And from there, 2008, you know what happened? We come down to 2016. Of course, in between G20 also happens. We come down to 2016, you have the Brexit and immigration stance by Trump. And we come straight down to 2024. And there seems to be so much of a flux around. I wonder, and I think that I think each decade did have it with them but we have coped with it differently. So we are meeting here today to look at how the next level of globalization, international economic cooperation, how this is going to unfurl and move forward in a different manner. So there are new forms of restrictions. In fact, we are just having this conference immediately on the back of the 13th uh, ministerial you know, uh, conference of the WTO and uh, Till from 2019 till date, there has been no dispute resolution that has happened because that's been under, you know, kept under wraps till it gets addressed. And so we come down to giving you this backdrop and I come to you, Rahul, to, to address the first session and be the first speaker. And the questions were really put down to, given this geoeconomic flux, which gets integrated with the geopolitical flux around, okay? How has it impacted the overall international economic cooperation, whether it's trade, investment, information, people? How have they got affected? Are we moving towards a more plurilateral regime from a multilateral regime? And then moving down, we come to the third part of the question over here, what kind of restrictions have increased or arisen? Uh, old ones have continued, like sanctions, but what new ones have come in? I think each one of you could bring in your regional context and your country context to give it a more global framework. Over to you, uh, Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Jyoti. Yeah. So, you know, just to kind of take a step back, since you sort of laid out last 100 years of progress and, you know, various stages of globalization, I think it's a question of if you sort of think of it as a sine curve, right, and you move up and then you move down, 
we are probably on the move down phase at this point in time in terms of global trade where it stands. So at level terms, global trade continues to grow. You know, you, you have basically a situation where the world feels more integrated from a travel perspective. You know, you have, you have greater mobility of people compared to where we were 100 years back. But effectively, uh, for the last 15 years or so, and I, I picked that time frame uh, very carefully because I think the global financial crisis and you know its ramifications, both in terms of what it did to general confidence levels, and you know you had two incidents basically or two uh, dimensions of it. First, there was the, the the fall of the say the U.S. housing market, uh, this economic stagnation which really plagued uh, you know a lot of issues or created a lot of issues in the West, and then you had simultaneous rise of China, right? I mean the, these two parallel events were kind of moving together. And that effectively led to a situation where we have seen a gradual rollback of globalization, especially from a trade perspective. But then I think the weaponization of trade and, you know, like supply chains, etc., in the last few years, particularly in the backdrop of COVID, has really accelerated the process. Now, you can look for numerical examples of, you know, which country has imposed what kind of trade restrictions. But then there's also the parallel more structural issue of you know climate change green transition which is leading to trade restrictions of different kinds right so uh, you know we we can talk about say the border adjustment mechanisms uh, say that european union has proposed in context of uh, getting uh, goods from other parts of the world but then you also have sanctions coming in you know we have seen basically a fracturing of agreement that global trade is a good thing right and and this is not necessarily happening uh, you know across the world i think people are basically and india as well in that context has become more and more opportunistic. But this also kind of reflects, uh, you know, the fact that people are not really thinking about it on an ideological basis, number one. And number two, they are not trying to take a very long-term view of what global trade should look like, right? Because your immediate requirement of, say, getting iron and steel, getting uh, oil, getting uh, energy, getting people, you know, is now. This needs to be solved in six or 12 months. So you're not going to take a five-year view saying, oh, I'm not going to do something, you know, because I am ideologically opposed to this. But that, I think, has been the fundamentally the biggest change when we think about globalization, that the world has become very short-term in its approach. Most countries, and, and this is very visible in policies that, say, the US has adopted in, in the wake of, say, the CHIPS Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, and, and it's leading to more and more fissures as far as the broad uh, policy environment is concerned. Now, is there a possibility that this changes anytime soon? I, I think at this particular point in time, and this is a point I always make to my clients when I meet them, is that we have probably entered a decade where you know, the political imperative is going to dominate uh, you know, the economic logic in, in, many, in many ways. So the whole restructuring of supply chains, you know, talking about resiliency over efficiency, I mean, these are all new, not new buzzwords. I mean, they have been around for a while. But the fact is, you are seeing that, uh, you know, being played out in very different ways. And, you know, I, I think just to kind of talk a little bit about India, I mean, India finds itself in a very interesting sweet spot that, you know, we have the demand side, we have, uh, you know, a, a young population which is getting uh, used for, you know, some of these uh, uh, areas. And then we also have been able to kind of navigate the geopolitical landscape from a foreign policy perspective in a very, very interesting way, which has led to outcomes, I think, which most of us would not have predicted, you know, when the war broke out, right? I think particularly in the last couple of years. So from that perspective, we have done okay to navigate these challenges. I think the real question will be how long can we continue to do that? And I think that's a bit of an open question because not everything is in our control, right? So we will, we will be, uh, you know, viewed uh, policy takers in certain areas. But I, I think, broadly speaking, I, I can't see a scenario where in the next two, three years, and there's not a comment on the political outcomes, right? We don't know. But irrespective of what the broader political outcomes are globally, we are in a year of you know significant elections, I don't see there being a political consensus at a global level, right, on, on, on the notion that you need to continue to integrate more and more because you are seeing different... Uh, types of restrictions coming up, whether it is on mobility of goods, mobility of services, mobility of people. And I think the only thing which, where there seems to be very little control is mobility of ideas, right? So this can, you know, kind of come across in Instagram, you know, a, a particular meme going viral that happens at a global level nowadays, but it could also mean that you have certain, you know, technologies, etc., which will transcend borders. And, you know, that is really where 
globalization is most visible at the moment. Everywhere else, we seem to be retracing at the margin. Yeah. Thank you so much, Rahul. I think you talked about the ideological basis being dropped. And from here, I think I, I'll take the session to you, Famida. Uh, over to you. Thank you very much. I would like to f uh, first uh, thank uh, the organizers for inviting me to speak at this August gathering. I'm really honored and humbled. Uh, and also for the topic which has been selected and the theme itself is so important and uh, timely because we are all going through this, um, this globalization, the, um, the context you have set and also the um, announcer, I don't know her name, but she also very nicely um, mentioned uh, the context, uh, the preface of this globalization, how it is all encompassing on the one hand, but it also um, um, having impacts on us in various ways. Because there is, first of all, I mean, as an economist, you have uh, rightly mentioned that globalization, you know, it's it's a means to progress, but it is not automatic. And it is not going to have a similar impact on various sections of the people, be it the first uh, wave of globalization, second wave of globalization, now third wave of globalization. I think we are at the end of third wave of globalization. We are, in fact, approaching the fourth wave of globalization, as we say, that fourth industrialization like that. Um, so. The first one was very easy, but then the uh, trouble started you know, towards the second and third. So at this point in time, what we are observing globally, that the global economy has increased the size itself, and also the amount of wealth has increased. And technological progress has really tremendously made our lives easy. And at the same time, we're also observing that the volume of trade um, and the transactions in terms of trade and financial transactions, the volume has increased. So to some extent, and to a great extent, I would say that you know, the world has seen such progress which it has not seen ever before. And it can only you know, be better. But on the other hand, the irony is that the challenges are also huge and insurmountable. Take the example of uh, the inequality. Despite having you know, uh, so much of wealth globally, we are observing inequality across the world, be it a developed country, be it a developing and least developed country, that is uh, you know, increasing as rapidly as the wealth is uh, increasing. The second one is that the technological um, innovation, that has made our life so simple, so easy, but at the same time, it is also disrupting or making intrusion our, um, into our lives. We, one doesn't know that you know, what is left now, so everyone, all our data and information um, is uh, getting stored somewhere, and how those are being used and what kind of problems um, we are going to face in the future, that is something which is really, really scary. And the third one is, of course, the impact of climate change. It is uh, one of the most important uh, problems right now because whatever progress you make, no matter how much, it, how good you bring in, the, unless and until we can control, we can tackle the impact of climate change, it, it, everything you know, will be washed away. It is not only an issue of the countries which are vulnerable to the impact of you know, climate change, which are mostly the poor and marginalized countries, but also it's going to you know, hurt the people of the developed countries in the long run, because this is a you know, cross-boundary issue. And it's not an issue that, you know, if I am saved and the other countries are going to be, you know, facing sea level rise or facing natural disaster, cyclone, cedar, and we, are, we will be, you know, living in a glass house. Because we see that in some of the countries, even in the United States, when, where the technology is so, you know, up, uh, up to date and so 
vast, so accessible. When there is simple flooding or cyclone, how they struggle to tackle that. I think Bangladesh tackles better than the um, you know, advanced countries in terms of uh, uh, tackling the impact of climate change. So the you know, issue what I'm trying to um, highlight is that globalization brought in many um, positives, but it also has uh, the negatives. But it doesn't mean that we will be you know, shying away from globalization. Because there's a saying that if you open the window, there will be flies or dust. But for that, we wouldn't close the windows because we need fresh air also. So it is the issue how we tackle that. And this is not an issue of any particular country or particular region. It is a global issue. And to that extent, I would like to bring in the issue of global governance as well. Local or domestic governance, we all are you know, familiar, we are facing every day, day to day. But at the global level, it is so important and it is also very difficult to make any changes. What we are doing right now, the organizations which are, uh, which are tasked with uh, various responsibilities, finance or trade or environmental climate issues, so they are dealing with issues which are evolving every day. We are dealing with 21st century issues, but we have a 19th or 20th century lens. So that has to be changed. And you touched upon the issue of the um, 13th ministerial meeting of the WTO, which is right now going on. It was supposed to close on the 29th, as it always happens that, you know, last minute they cannot come to an agreement, um, so they have to extend. So they ha it has been extended by one day. But I don't think that one day will also bring in any good, because what I have seen, that Doha round is you know, still going on and on. We can, I don't know how much time I have, we can come in again, yeah, because yeah. this, uh, what we are now, you know, instead of multilateralism, we are moving into that plurilateralism, bilateralism. So Absolutely. why it is not working, again, the global governance of these bodies. Thank you. So you have thrown light on a very important part that though global governance is there, um, we know that in the last, in fact, four years, there have been 64 uh, regional trading arrangements that have got added to the 101 which got added from 2010 onwards. So obviously this has made trade difficult, but the outcomes that you see when you look at the data, it looks that trade is still on the rising path. And though it may be in nominal terms, because inflation is high, but um, the trade GDP ratio in 2022 stood at 62%. Um, so over to you, um, Anakin, uh, for you to give your perspective, the European and the global perspective. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much for your kind invitation. And thanks to the organizers for bringing together such an interesting group of people. I had a wonderful dinner yesterday. I had the opportunity to talk to very many of you. So uh, I love to be back in India. I just came from the ministerial meeting in Abu Dhabi in the World Trade Organization. So I didn't finish that meeting before coming here. And, and as you just said, Dr. Famida, uh, they are finalizing hopefully tonight, the negotiations. And I hope they will achieve an agreement. I think there is a need for global trade agreements. But I also believe there will be more trade agreements between India and several countries in the world. And I hope we will be able to finalize a trade, free trade agreement between the EFTA countries, where Norway is a member, and also India, because that will open up opportunities. So I think, as Rahul said, there will be more focus on security, supply chains, but at the same time, I think globalization will continue because this is in our all self-interest. Um, let me take one example. The climate agenda, we have reached agreements here, and this opens up for new business opportunities, both for Norway and also for India. For instance, in the maritime sector, uh, where we have a lot of technology in Norway, and you have a lot of skilled labor. And together now, we are developing the maritime green industry. 
so in that regard, I think this trend will continue even though we are protecting ourselves more um, when it comes to vulnerability in the supply chains and so. so let me end by saying a few words also about uh, the UN, because Norway and India had uh, different seats together in the UN Security Council. Uh, Norway, uh, you are, India is there quite often, but Norway uh, has a seat in the security country maybe every 20 years or so. And uh, together we achieved, during these two years, to protect the international rules-based order. Even though we didn't always get re resolutions through, we had the same interest. Rule of law, international rules-based order. So even though United Nations is not perfect, this is the only alternative we have. So let me end. This, inter um, um, this part by quoting the second Secretary General of the United Nations. He said, The UN was not created to take humanity to heaven, but to save us from hell. Thank you. Thank you for that lovely remark. And so we come to you, Lars. Um, to give in your perspective? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you can hear me. Um, thank you for inviting me, and I'm sorry for not being there, but uh, uh, I'm sure this is fascinating. Let me just say one remark on the, on the sort of uh, historical perspective, which was, of course, uh, right on. Um, just want to add also 1989, because that was sort of the fall of the Berlin Wall, and you know, I'm coming from Berlin here. And, you know, that led to a whole bunch of changes. Mr. Putin was actually working for the secret services in Germany at the time in Dresden. And he said many times that he sees as the main problem of the 20th century was the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, and, of course, we Germans think differently uh, for obvious reasons. Uh, and I think that is still underpinning a lot of the developments we're seeing right now in the Ukraine and uh, and others, which for Europeans, of course, is a very important development and actually has also led to a big discussion, for example, on the G20, which I was you know, organizing as a Sherpa for 10 years. Um, so I think that's, uh, that is also a, a big thing. And the other issue, I think, is that we're sort of looking after World War II, I and mean, this might be a very you know, European perspective, as really were sort of the West, and I think that's part of the problem now, the West sort of created some, you know, the governance, a lot of the governance, actually. Um, um, and that has actually, you know, led to a lot of benefits to countries like Germany and, and also Norway, which are free trading countries. And that is sort of changing now. And uh, so I think those those are for us sort of the, the big steps. And, and I'm not a big fan of categorizing globalizations. I think these are all processes which are developing. And I think some of the remarks you made is we have to be careful. It doesn't go too far in a direction which actually doesn't help the people and doesn't help equality and fairness also. I think that's very important. So, so my remarks are basically three points. I do believe that the old world is somewhat changing. Uh, I think it's been fairly recent also with the US elections and let's see what happens this year that a lot of the sort of multilateralism, you mentioned it, trade and, and investment and, and, and supply chains, that is being challenged. Um, and maybe that's a good thing. And I think we're going more towards what, what you know, many people call the multipolar world. Um, and plurilateralism may be the answer to a multipolar world. But I do think that you have, you have different poles emerging, and not just China and the US, I think there's also Latin America, there's uh, Middle East, there's, there's India. And I think that's a good thing. And I think what Obama said that always, we should rather than fighting each other, you know, keeping others down, maybe that's sort of, you know, some of the Americans think we need to keep China down, we need to work with them. And I think this is, this is gonna be my main point at the end. So I think the world is changing. And the reasons is people were unhappy with, with, with a, you know, I think that it led to inequalities. It didn't solve a lot of the global issues. And there has been a tectonic shift in global economic powers. I mean, India is a perfect example. And I think that's a good thing. 
Um, but what we should not do is now add too many restrictions to, to growth. Um, and somebody said we're moving from just in time to just in case. You know, just in time being an efficient economy, just in case being, yeah, let's be worried, let's have national protections. And Europe is, I think, in danger of that. Uh, I know Norway is, is very differently, but other countries in Europe, I think, are more worried, typically bigger countries. And they're sort of bending into national nationalism also. And uh, they think the answer to all of that is sort of more Europe in the sense of national nationalism and not in the sense of working together with the rest of the world. So I think that is, and you can go through that Inflation Reduction Act, let me pick on the Americans. I mean, that's blatantly protectionist. Uh, they've been preaching the rest of the world for the last 10 years not to have local content, and here we are. Um, so I think that the West itself is actually, um, you know, some you know destroying some of the institutions themselves, and let's let's hope that not happen. So all of that, I think, the danger is it will lead to more inflation, to less growth, um, and it's one to be very fair to smaller countries. I think that's why the W two is very important, rather than these bilateral agreements, which you know I've been negotiating for Germany as well. Because it's unfair. We we need to solve these problems uh, together. Um, the other point. So I think that's my description of it. So we should be careful of not going too far in that direction. Um, the other thing is challenges are global. I mean, climate change is something which is a global issue. We're not going to solve that by retreating back to to nationalistic policies. Um, and therefore, I think. We need a new global playbook. I'm happy to expand on that when we go in the discussion. Let me let me stop here. So I, I do think that it's in a new phase. We're in a new phase. I think there are good reasons. And I think we should, I think the minister said on the WTO, maybe going for plurilaterals. Um, but we need a new playbook, which, which avoids sort of the pitfalls of uh, going down the wrong path in terms of solving these global issues. So let me leave it at that, and then I can expand on that later on. So thank, thank you for your comments, uh, Lars. And so we come down to the next part of our uh, discussion, panel discussion. Uh, when we talked about trade being restricted uh, through sanctions, through carbon taxes that are being talked about, carbon border adjustment mechanism, through the failure of dispute mechanisms at the WTO, which have not got realized, RTAs coming up, and a lot of such things. How do firms in this situation adjust upon, you know, how do the firms grow? What are the challenges that they face? How are they going to optimize in terms of constrained maximization against optimum maximization. There's al always going to be an impact on the bottom line. What's going to be its impact on the capital flows? Because we've seen, uh, especially in 2002, the FDIs have fallen to the levels of 2000. They've really come down. So in that sense, how do you think firms are going to get uh, ad adjust to themselves? And therefore, uh, will this all impact things like finances for sustainable development goals, finances for climate change. So I'm over to you, Anakin, for to taking this round now. And you have three minutes because we got limited time. Well, um, since I only have three minutes, I'll only answer one part of your questions about the International Division of Labor. I think we will see more of that in the future. But in countries in the Gulf, for instance, there is they're given ILO a much more important role. And I think this is a prerequisite for more international division of labor. Because if Norwegian companies are going to invest more in India, there will be increased focus also on condition for, for labor. So that will always be a part of all kind of trade agreements. Um, because we are, have to solve, as Lars said, he, he talked about the climate change. And, 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 and we really need to work for that together. So um, recently I visited a company in Norway and they have uh, developed autonomous um, barges with zero emission technology. And these barges are developed in Norway 
but built here in India. And by doing so, um, India is getting access to new and green technology, and we are getting access to skilled labor. So I think this is a win-win situation, but we need more common standards on the climate and also labor standards, even though we cannot compare um, labor standards and introduce the same labor standards in all countries. I think this is extremely important. And uh, we also need to understand why United States now is protecting their own labor market. They have lost a lot of jobs during the last um, years. So we need to understand that also in order to um, create better international regulations in that, uh, in that regards. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Lars, we are over to you with three minutes for you to contribute to the session. Okay. Um, if I understand it correctly, I think, I mean, there's a big debate right now, what should governments do and what should firms do in terms of these, let's say, climate change. Um, and, um, and I think the challenge for governments is to work together. I mean, I've been negotiating the climate part in the G20. Uh, and let me just pick on carbon pricing. Um, it's been very difficult. I mean, we're doing some steps in the right direction in Europe. I'm not a big fan of the border adjustment tax because I'm afraid that creates all kinds of um, adverse effects. But, you know, it's coming. And um, the German government in the end also agreed to it. Uh, but so I do need, I think we need to look at global pricing and, um, you know, there are, you know, certain countries in the G20, which always blocked a move in that direction. Um, so I think we need to work together. And my hope is, and I was just in China talking to some of the responsible people there that, you know, as it gets worse, as we move forward, you know, climate is clearly not, not going the way it should be going. The pressures will be hopefully larger, larger and larger from societies on governments to actually do work together. Um, but I'm not sure. So, so I do think it's important. I also think it's important. We haven't talked about that very much as reform, the, the governments, the international fund. You talked about financing. I'm you know, chairman at BlackRock looking at climate finance. Of course, they're looking only at things where there's enough return. So this blended finance idea, the reform of the World Bank, I think is very important other aspects, which I think we really need to get our act together. We've been talking about that for 10 years, how to get public money better, you know, implemented to, to trigger private money. The whole development aid really hasn't worked very well from the West. So I think that's another, so that's, I think, main parts of the governments. But at the same time, there's some responsible business leaders um, which think, you know, given that governments can't get, I mean, put it bluntly, can't get their act together, because they're under political constraints, which are reasonable. So let, we need to do it. So we need to have more joint ventures. We need to work together. We need to develop technologies. Um, and, and I know that the German companies are very active uh, also in India. I think we've been working on a free trade agreement with the EU for years, which still hasn't happened, by the way, the EU-India free trade agreement. We were very close at some point. So I think there's a role for for firms to to also um, to also contribute. Um, yeah, so I think those are some of the the things which I think need to be happening. So in this puzzle of 193 countries and the complexities of globalization and trade, over to you, you know, Rahul, to give your perspective. Yeah. So I I, I think uh, you know most of the time my impression would be that companies don't necessarily sit and take a long-term view on, you know, how are they going to take calls, or, especially in the last few years, right? So I'll come back to the point that ultimately they are responding to what the economic outcomes are around them and how it's going to play out. I think one fundamental change that has come about in this particular decade, you know, and we have had COVID, supply chain disruptions, the wars, relative to what was happening in the previous two decades, right, where you, you had basically a very peaceful globalization that was going on, is that the whole logic of efficiency, profitability, dictating how capital flows are going to move is completely dead. Right now, it is more driven by what if your factory can get shut down the next day? What are you going to do? What if your key suppliers are? So, so it's not a necessarily just a question of you know the resiliency aspect 
is both in terms of your ability to access and your ability to disrupt, right? So when, when US does Inflation Reduction Act, they are basically trying to ensure that their own supplies are not going to be disrupted, right? Whether it is in the form of goods or services. At the end of the day, th this was kind of the point I was trying to make uh, in my opening remarks that it's, we, there is a bit of a siege mentality that has crept into governance networks and also in boardrooms, right? So uh, this is not going to change just like that, right? You need significant progress for, for this kind of mentality to be rolled back and you need years and years of stability for that to happen, but clearly that's not the direction of travel. The other point here is that, you know, the, the fact that you are seeing differentiated pricing, particularly for key resources, right? And this could be in the form of, say, energy, where, you know, say, if we take the example of a large German company, which chose to kind of, you know, which is kind of gradually moving to China because they can get cheaper energy over there. This kind of dynamic is also going to be at play, right? It's a question of where are you supplying to, who are you supplying to, where are you getting your raw materials from? And that, I think, will ultimately determine, you know, what the industrial shape will look like in the next 10, 15 years. Part of it is also very visible in India itself, say, with the Apple ecosystem developing. It is not that India is the core, core source of demand, right? It, it, India accounts for about 4 or 5% of overall iPhone sales, but, you know, eventually, the gradual demand is going to come from this part of the world, especially if China tomorrow decides to say that, well, you cannot use iPhones anymore, right? If they block out the OS, then you have no choice but to shift, uh, you know, shift to and look at other growing markets. So I think it's both a combination of resiliency that will drive uh, performance. One final point I would make in terms of what governments can do, I, I think ultimately governments cannot force, particularly in the Western world, you know, they can only influence to a certain extent, but the one very fundamental change which has come about as well, particularly in the context of US-China and what we are seeing on the trade friction, is that the US industrial complex has now taken a very adverse view of what's happening in China. They don't necessarily see China as a market, they see it as a competitor. And hence, whatever seven, eight years of trade policy change that has come about is partly being driven by the industrial side, right? Not necessarily, or, or by the banking side, or, you know, you have different businesses who are driving that change. So, so you can see that uh, you know, there is an element of uh, bipartisanship that has come about because the business interests are not aligned. And this incrementally, I think, is something we also need to think about very seriously in context of India. Because in India, we also need businesses to actually take a very active view and, you know, a, a view on what is the right foreign policy approach, right? The government cannot do everything and they may not even be aware of what the, uh, you know, uh, what the dependencies are. So the business has to take a much more active view of what the state of relationships of, of our relationships with the world should be like. From here, we come come to you, Famida. Uh, three minutes. Um, thank you. Uh, the issue which I touched upon earlier also, you just uh, asked us to elaborate a little bit. So um, the issue of climate um, issues, climate challenges, how to tackle. So as I have mentioned, this is a global problem, maybe affecting the poorer countries more, but it has to be dealt uh, globally. And in a, in a manner that the developed countries provide support. Support is needed in three areas, mainly. One is finance. It requires a lot of investment, for both for climate adaptation and mitigation and also for technological adapt, um, technology for mitigation particularly. And the third aspect is capacity development. Even if you have the you know, technology, access to technology, how those are going to be used because it's end, at the end of the day, it is the common people who are facing the challenge, the farmers, the you know, fishermen, and also the people who are um, at the margins. So regarding the climate technology, I want to highlight as the WTO ministerial goes on, uh, I'm also coming from there. So one important issue is now that access to climate technology. You remember when COVID um, had hit us, the main issue was access to vaccines. Even though humanity was dying, but corporations were not giving access to their patented uh, you know, vaccine formula, 
But then, of course, uh, there were political leadership came up, and then there were good senses prevailed. But then, similar cases, are we facing similar cases in case of climate technology? Because um, the, as we know that you know, um, within WTO, uh, TRIPS, under the TRIPS Agreement, TRIPS uh, Clause 66.2, which talks about tr technology transfer to the least developed countries, which has never happened um, in a true sense. And I come from a country which is the least developed country right now, but going to be graduating by 2026. So this is going to be a real challenge, maybe, you know, for uh, Nepal also, um, and the other uh, LDCs within the region, that once we graduate, we are going to lose that. But on top of that, the technology, which are very, very expensive, uh, we are not going to have uh, access to that. That is why access to finance has become so important. And with this regard, I would also like to mention that you know, in, at the international level, uh, many organizations, many uh, you know, multilateral organizations, they are working in silos. Um, of course, climate issue is an issue of UNFCCC, but it has cross-cutting and you know, it is linked to the WTO issues, it is linked with the uh, financial institutions like World Bank, IMF, and many other, you know, by uh, many um, multilateral financial organizations, multilateral development banks. So, but we see that quite often that their policies are, you know, in, in silos, there's no coherence and no co integration of ideas. So this is one of the challenges why despite having so much of resources, despite having so much of talks and discussions, it, at the end of the day, the, we don't see the output. We don't see the results. So collaboration within the organizations is very important. So yes, um, uh, we will now open the house to the, you know, for questions. And uh, we have Ambassador Mohan Kumar here. So. Any other questions from this side? Okay, you'll go next. Um, and you could address your question to a particular panelist, you know, so that would make it easy. Right. Thank you, Jyoti. Um, I'd like to introduce myself as, a, as an extinguished diplomat and a flourishing academic. So I was an ambassador in a previous birth, but thank you very much, a fascinating panel. I think it's important to also look at the reasons why globalization has changed from the second to third. I thought the second one was purely economic, and I'm inclined to think this globalization is geopolitical. So from, it's the economy stupid, it's now the, it's the geopolitics stupid. And I think the reason is that it's very interesting. In the West, I think the former model of globalization produced more losers than winners. But in countries like India, that's not the case. We actually have more winners than losers. So your question is to... Hope. So my question is actually the entire panel, but perhaps actually to the former Norwegian minister, because in the West, I think you have a problem. You had more losers than winners. As you rightly said, the US, they lost jobs and so on. But in India, that's not the case. We would have quite, we'd have been quite happy to continue actually with that model of globalization, but we don't have a choice. The other thing I feel is that the state is back. So we've gone from Washington consensus, which talked of shrinking the state to really a very small role, to an East Asian consensus where the state is playing a big role. Now, if you were to shift to that model, and I think you, you talked of, um, this may be addressed to Rahul, you know, you talked of Inflation Reduction Act, the Europeans want to CBAM. The Indian state has not been that great, although I used to belong to the Indian state for 40 years, I should know. I think we are not great at delivery and so on. And that is true for the South Asian region as well. So how is that going to leave countries like India when you need a strong state and the state is really back in a big way? Thank you, Jyoti. First of all, I would like to say is that Norway is a small country, it's totally dependent on the international free trade. And if we look on figures from 1990, where the world sort of opened up, we have a, had a tremendous 
economic growth because of more international trade. So in that respect, we have the same interests as very many African countries and also countries in the global south. So I don't think um, these terms that West has certain interests um, and that the global south has other interests. I don't think that's, um, that's a meaningful distinction, actually, uh, because we have benefited a lot. But I think um, we will see an United States and they want to protect their labor standards and they will do that domestically. And I think that IRA has very many good things because it is a very good instrument. So America will take place in the green shift. On the other hand, it also creates obstacles also for Norwegian businesses. And I don't believe in a competition of subsidies, because that will not lead to innovation. So um, here we have common interests, I believe, with uh, India. So we are facing parallel trends. I think we'll see more globalization on one hand, but on the other hand, all countries, including China, including India and Norway, we will protect critical infrastructure more than before. This is a lesson learned from both COVID, but also the war and the invasion of Ukraine. And I think of our German friend here, uh, he can confirm that, that we need to also look at alternative supply chains so we are not getting that vulnerable. But um, yeah, so that's my Thank you. brief Thank you. answer. Yes, over to you. Atul Singh, I'm the founder, CEO, and editor in chief of Fair Observer. Uh, platform for world affairs. I live in Washington and uh, I was on Capitol Hill on January 6th, not breaking in, but talking to people. So, <laughs> so quick question. If you look at the US, the US created the post for order, 1991, big change. You had a unipolar world. And uh, now uh, what uh, Chancellor Olaf Scholz has called, uh, we are facing a Zeitung when day, 24th February, 2022 invasion of Ukraine. But I would say the Zeitung Wendy begins with the election of Donald Trump, and he throws out the TPP, and we are in the Asia Economic Dialogue. TPP gets thrown out of the window, tariffs on China. The world thinks Biden will come in and we will go back to free trade. Instead, he doubles down on the Trump protectionist policy. Now, if there is one thing on which you have bipartisan consensus, and I can say it because I've talked to both Democrats and Republicans, surprise, surprise, is that they need more protectionism. How do we navigate this brave new world? And by the way, Rahul, I completely con concur that uh, political imperative will dominate economic logic for the next 10 years. So, Great remark. So would you want Lars to answer this? I, I don't care who answers it. Okay. I'd lo love to hear the wise people up there. <laughs> okay. Lars, over to you. Okay. Sorry, sorry, I was yeah, muted. Yeah, yeah I forgot. No, I, I would agree with much of that, uh, especially the double down of Biden. But there was still a difference between the Biden administration and the Trump administration um, uh, in the sense of a commitment to multilateralism, at least sort of, um, you know, in the G20 and many international fora. But the policy is actually, I would agree with the assessment, uh, actually, Trump won wasn't so bad in the end, let me say. We were expecting much worse from him. Um, but it's interesting to now look at what will happen if he gets reelected. You know, I think there, there's a lot of talk on that. Um, and so I think that's, that's, uh, that's a very important thing. Um, and I think that on the point of geopolitics dominating economics, that's undoubtedly true. I think that's a problem also. And my point was that we need to, you know, have a good playbook for the geopolitics. So, and because we need to solve problems for the people in the end. This is actually going to be interesting to see in the US elections, because you have somebody who's dividing, who is actually, you know, not really giving any answers to the real problems of the people is my view. And, um, and I think that also look at other countries, certainly the point also, 
Germans have benefited from good. We don't have more losers than winners. We have vastly more winners than losers from globalization. I think this is true for Europe in general. It may even be true for the United States. Uh, because the counterfactual is that you go away from globalization too much. I think we will go away, security of supply, Minister from Norway, I would agree, we need to be more careful. But the counterfactual is much worse for the people than if we get a right balance between geopolitics and economics. And I think in the end, people care about welfare, especially in those countries where economic growth hasn't been, welfare hasn't been, you know, it's a huge catch up needed. So, so it goes back to um, we need to get a playbook. Uh, and let me just say my three elements of the playbook and then I'll shop up. I think the first one is we're going to a multipolar world and we need to have as much overlaps as possible. So I think the BRICS expanding, the G7 expanding, I think we're not going to have one thing, but there should at least be enough overlaps. Second, we need to have the governance reform. As I was saying earlier, I think World Bank, IMF, UN, we need to have, and, and there's a financing issue there, and there's a, a governance issue. Other countries, particularly also Africa, they want to have more say in where the money is going. So I think we need to reform that. And I think the third one is what this conference is about. We need to have dialogue uh, between these poles. Um, and I need to find common grounds. It's a bit like in trade. We're not going to have comprehensive trade agreements, but we have plurilateral. There are areas where we should work with China. I disagree with, with, you know, basically, you know, looking at them as an adversary. I think there are areas like climate change where we should work. So a pragmatic approach towards globalization, I think, is very, very important. I've been propagating that. I think Olaf Scholz is a, is a proponent of that because ultimately we need to solve these problems for the people. Otherwise, we won't get reelected. Can I? Sorry. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, add, in the interest uh, of time. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, Jyoti, can I add uh, one point on this? Yeah. So, so I think this is a very pertinent issue because effectively uh, what we are seeing in some ways is that you, you, you're sort of having this logic of, you know, what the globalization is desired from a normative perspective versus the way it's playing out, right? And I think this has been the fundamental change that it is no longer ideologically driven, right? Uh, like it's, there's nobody, like nobody's listening to the IMF when they're saying we want to do more trade because, well, you're not sure, you don't want to trade with certain countries, right? So if you have differentiated, uh, you know, cho choice of like saying, okay, I want to uh, import from this country or I want to export to that country, you will see that fracturing, you know, come about. It may still lead to a better outcome, but this is completely, uh, you know, this is going to be the dynamic for the next, uh, you know, decade or so. I think on the point around the, the geopolitical and, and the government imperative, I, I think this is being driven by the industry, right? This is the big change. Like in US, it is driven by the industry. In India, when we didn't sign up to RCEP, right? This is, I'm talking about 2018. India lucked into industrial policy way before anyone else did. And we did it b because we were not very strong on the trade side. But India is now going back to free trade agreements, right? So I think the opportunism of the whole trade structure, right, is going to be determined by what is your own context. And here, one final point would be that for countries which are adding demand to the world, right, which run current account deficits, US, India, you have parts of Southeast Asia, they are fundamentally in an advantage because you are adding demand to the world. Europe cannot pursue industrial policy simply because they are dependent on trade, right? And that, I think, is going to be a bit of a challenge as to how do you navigate that. Okay, so in the interest of time, we will um, not take any more questions. Um, we end on a note by thanking all our panelists, thanking our audience. Yes, we know globalization has its sense of opaqueness. It has increased. But the manner in which it is unfurling, we do not know. It's a question of running with the, run with the hare and hunt with the hounds. And therefore, ideological-based principles are no longer really there in, in a number of situations because self-interest dominates what is called the overall good. But despite that, somehow the global order is coming out with something which is working, but some things which are not. So thank you on this front, and uh, we can conclude with this session. Thank you so much, Jyoti. May I request um, Secretary Kumaran to come up?
uh, Secretary for the Ministry of External Affairs to come up and present a small token of our appreciation to our panelists. So if I could perhaps ask the Secretary first of all uh, to thank Fahida. Dr. Famida Khatun, thank you. Anneken Hutfeld. And Rahul Majoria. Big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. And to our chair, Jyoti. Jandra Mani.